Welcome back to Computer Science E1. So nice to see you all again. This is Lecture 9, Security Continued. We got an email just the other day from someone who had tuned into the podcast and had thanked us, actually, for talking up John Stewart's segment on why the Internet is like a series of tubes and pipes, or rather not like a series of tubes and pipes. And uh, this podcast viewer lamented the fact that at the time, no one in the audience here live really knew what we were talking about. So a fun way, I thought, to start off today's lecture would be to show this four-minute clip from The Daily Show featuring John Hodgman. This was a running gag on The Daily Show for a while, and I tried to pick up one of the uh, most interesting clips, most humorous. You can visit this on the web yourself at ComedyCentral.com. And without further ado, here we go. in charge of the committee that regulates the internet. Now, uh, we obviously didn't spend a lot of time discussing the bill that sparked the senator's comments. It's called the Net Neutrality Act. It's a fairly complex bit of legislation. So here to discuss it, our resident expert, John Hodgman. John, thank you so much. Before, Sean, before we begin, though, I'd like to say a few words in defense of Senator Stevens. The senator is right in some respects. The internet is not a dump truck. Here is a picture of a dump truck. With rare exceptions, people cannot use that picture to masturbate. <laughs> Therefore, it is not the Internet. <laughs> now, as for calling the Internet a series of tubes, that, I admit, was not the most apt comparison. A better metaphor might be, oh, I don't know off the top of my head, a net <laughs> or an Internet. Computers connected through a globally Spanishing mesh of some kind? You, you, you could say World Wide Web. No, I, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> so what is net neutrality? Well, let's say we're both computers here on the mesh. Uh, what, what kind of computer would, would you be? Uh, <laughs> in, in the, in the... I, I, guess I could be a home computer or a network server of uh -huh, some kind. Uh -huh. what, 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 what type of operating system would you be? Uh, uh, well, statistically speaking, it would probably be a, a Windows operating system. So definition. Of so 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 you'd be like a like a personal computer, or to, to use I guess the common abbreviation. Okay. I'm a PC. Uh, uh, so uh, so uh, I guess I, I would then be a different type of okay, computer. Okay, that's 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 enough of that. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, information is broken down and travels over the internet in discrete chunks called packets. So here's a packet, and I will send it along. Oh, okay. And then, and then, so what is in these packets that are going along? Well, it could be the anything internet. on the internet: spam, videos of lonely teens practicing with their lightsabers, <laughs> comical reimaginings of movie uh, premises, Brokeback Mountain, for example, <laughs> cats dressed as nuns eating from dishes of gravy. <laughs> or, or, or maybe even useful information or, or news analysis. Uh, I guess. In fact, <laughs> these are all Chuck Norris jokes. You can read them entirely on the internet at hodgman.blogspot.chucknorrisjokes.edu. Dot, dot edu. Yeah, it's loosely affiliated with Yale University. <clears throat> Point is, with net neutrality, all of these packets, whether they come from a big company or just a single citizen, are treated in the exact same way. So, so, so what's the debate? That actually seems quite fair. Yes, almost too fair. It's as though the richer companies get no advantage at all. That's why the big telecom and cable corporations are lobbying to create a special class of Internet service where, for example, this packet from Google and this one from Amazon get through very easily. But this packet from <laughs> TimeWarner.org somehow gets routed a little differently. So, so, so that packet... That packet will not get through. Oh, no, no, they'll get through. It's just that they'll travel on a second tier of the Internet, which ironically will be a series of tubes. Met metaphorically. No, I said ironically. Actual pneumatic tubes. It's a little-known fact that President Eisenhower installed an interconnecting series of such tubes in all U.S. homes built before 1957. Go ahead at home, tear up your floorboards. You'll see what I'm talking about. I can wait here while you do it. John. Oh, well, oh, sorry. 
All I'm saying is that if the Net Neutrality Act fails, get ready for the excitement of the information super tube. <laughs> hey, I just got it from new mail. <laughs> Let's see here. What, uh, what, it, what does it say? <laughs> Another Chuck Norris joke. <laughs> That guy, always with the roundhouse kicks to the face. Uh... Thank you, John. John Hodgman, ladies and gentlemen. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome back to Computer Science E1. Let's see if we can put a more of a technical spin around some of these topics and others. So. Last week, we had our first introduction to computer security, and last week we focused more on threats and bad things. Tonight, we'll focus more on good things you can do in defense of those bad things. But first, a bit of review. What were some of the threats that we discussed last week? Viruses, worms. Viruses, worms? All right, what's a virus? Something that your computer spreads. Okay, something that gets into your computer and spreads. How does it get into your computer? Uh, you accept it in a receiving way from a spammer. Good, so you might accept this bad thing from an email by clicking on an attachment. What kinds of attachments are particularly dangerous, potentially, these days? So anything executable, and for the most part, we're talking about the PC world here, simply because there exist most, uh, most of the viruses and worms that are extant exist for PCs these days for various reasons, not the least of which certainly is Windows popularity. Uh, .exe, then, is an executable. .scr is also an executable that actually just refers to a screensaver. So one of the lessons we tried to preach last week is that if you ever get an email, even if it's from a friend saying, hey, this is the best new animation of singing horses I've ever seen, resist that temptation to open it because cute as it may be there have been many instances of cute such things inside of which is some kind of infection when a virus is on your computer what can it do to your computer erase files what else Slow it down, certainly, just by consuming CPU cycles. One of the most common activities for worms or viruses today, actually, is to send out emails. They come with a, a, they, an SMTP server of their own. Recall that SMTP stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, and this is just the protocol via which emails are sent. So some infections come effectively with an email a software built in, and that email program's sole purpose in life is just to send out spams and the beautiful thing about that is that these spams now appear not to be coming from some big server that you could easily blacklist and say that is the known source of spam but rather it's coming from your mom's computer your computer and so this poses a much more challenging problem for antivirus companies or for anti-spam companies because now you have spam not coming from one central source say but from all over the internet yeah It's a good question. So if you get an email that's from, say, Ray Diaz at harvard.edu, does that suggest that Ray's computer is infected? These days, no, because what is common practice for spam and also for spam generated by worms and viruses is to have the headers of those emails forged. And what that means is that even I could send you a seemingly spam-like message but pretend like it's from Ray. Rather, if you wanted to get a sense of whose computer is actually infected, a better way of doing that is to look at the email's headers, not just the two from date subject line, but go to the options menu, for the view menu in Microsoft Outlook, for instance, and go to options, and it will tell you a whole bunch of information. And actually, a question was asked a few weeks ago on Not Dumb Questions, so if you're curious to actually see an example of this, pull up notdumbquestions.com, and you'll see... Um, an example of an email headers that I pasted in and tried to give the question asker a sense of what information is in there. Among the information in there is, for instance, the sender's, take a guess, IP address of the sender. So sometimes, and it's tougher to do this these days, but sometimes when I've gotten a uh, an infected message, I'll occasionally glance at the headers and just see, do I recognize this IP address? Because if it's something, for instance, from harvard.edu, I might actually be able to figure out that it's from an office mate or someone on campus. And for instance, FAS Computer Services will sometimes do this if they realize that some kid's computer on campus is infected and it's doing some kind of malicious behavior. They'll use various technical
technical tricks such as that to figure out, well, whose computer is infected, and then call the kid up. Unfortunately, a lot of the junk you'll get is from someone over whom you have absolutely no control. And for instance, E1's website was being hit by something suspicious at one point, but we traced it to some IP address abroad. And at that point, it was sort of out of our hands. Since unless you get an administrator who cares about your problem, there's really not much you can do other than just ignore the packets that are coming in. Yeah? What do you mean by getting hit? Uh, getting hit by, uh, at the time, a lot, of the, a lot of content was being downloaded cyclically from the website and for seemingly no good reason. So um, by hit, though, you might generally mean it's like what's called a denial of service attack. This was a threat last week that we did not discuss, but a denial of service attack essentially is exactly what it means. It just means a computer or multiple computers just request so many darn times per second or per minute of a website that no one else can get through. And this has happened in the past where just a couple years ago, I think it was... Amazon.com or someone similarly big was essentially unavailable to a lot of people because there was a distributed denial of service attack, DDoS, going on. And this was just the result of a bunch of malicious computers or inf infected computers just requesting the heck out of that server. And by requesting the heck out of it, I just mean requesting the home page, requesting the home page, requesting the home page. That alone could block other people from getting in. So it's like a crowded throng of people at a store's door and only so many people can get in. At a time. What about a worm? There is a fundamental distinction between a virus and a worm. How is a worm different? A worm doesn't have a stationary source. A worm doesn't have a stationary source. That's true, though not the best way of distinguishing them, I would say. It travels by itself. It, excellent. So, and not necessarily by the web. If, just so through the internet, just to, through a series of tubes and pipes, do worms travel from computer to computer? This is only to say that a worm is self-propagating, whereas a virus pretty much by definition needs some stupidity or naivete on the part of a user to uh, execute it or to get it to uh, deliver its payload, its badness, whatever that happens to be. A worm, once on your computer, can jump to another computer simply on its own. Once it's on your computer, it's running. And I would go so far as to say that five times out of ten, six times out of ten, maybe even more to this day, worms in particular get into your computer simply because of bugs in operating systems. And Windows has been a huge offender of this because Windows has a whole bunch of servers essentially running on your computer, sometimes unbeknownst to you. These are servers or services, as they tend to be called, that do useful things, sometimes more esoteric than you need to care about, but they're nonetheless services running on your computer such that outsiders can try connecting to your computer, not in the sense of controlling it, but in the sense of passing information to your computer. And these services have sometimes been buggy, and they've been buggy in such a way that if a worm or an adversary sends the right kind of packet and the right type of data, what they can effectively do is send an exe through that hole, so to speak, and that executable can then start running on your computer. But ever since Windows Service Pack 2, a lot of those holes have begun to get plugged. And the fact that some of you even have a firewall running on your computer, how many of you run so-called Windows Firewall? Just turning something like that on is huge these days. Simply having your computer behind a home router in your house is a huge way of preventing or at least discouraging yourself from getting infected. And so actually that's a perfect segue to one of the first topics on tonight's agenda, which is this notion of a firewall. You've probably all heard of this, I, certainly in the context of the real world, in buildings or retail centers. What is a firewall meant to do? Block bad things out more specifically. Oh, in the uh, real world now for a moment, not the virtual world. So in a, retail, in a strip mall. There are generally, or at least in well-designed buildings, firewalls in between the units. Why are they there? Yeah, they, they're meant to be walls against fire. The idea being if some restaurant in a strip mall, for instance, all of a sudden has a grease fire in the kitchen, even if that restaurant goes up in flames, the wall depicted here is just a big brick wall, which might do the trick in some cases, discourages the fire from spreading to the nearby units. And so that analogy is applied similarly in the virtual world, where a firewall is, meant, is a virtual wall that's put in place in order to discourage bad stuff from getting into your computer or more generally getting into your land. Think back to that Warriors of the Net video. That was 
we like showing that because it's sort of a fun video and it sort of takes the fear factor away out of things like TCP IP. But if you recall, part of the video had a few holes in like a big wall. And there was this weird thing that was sort of throwing data into the holes. And some of the holes were 25 or 80. Do you remember this? Pictorial. So the idea of that segment in the film was that that wall represented a firewall, and it only had a fixed number of holes in it through which data could travel. And the only types of data that in the movie were allowed through, as I recall, were, for instance, port 80. Any packet coming in with TCP port 80 stamped on the so-called virtual envelope was let through. But if some data came in on, say, port 3389 or port 443, it would have just hit the wall. Well, what was port 80 used for? Why was that a good thing that it was allowed through? Uh, close. HTTP. And we'll distinguish those two more properly next week. That's fine. But port 80, recall, is the port used by HTTP. And just so you have a bit of familiarity with a couple others, what are 25 I mentioned? What's 25 used by? Good. So SMTP, AKA outgoing email. Any others come to mind? We'll do one other because you'll be using or two others since you might be using them for your final projects. If I said port 21, you might say FTP, good. And if I said 22, you might say this is a challenge of the acronyms SSH, which you may have used or might use for your final project. If these aren't familiar, don't worry, we'll get to them. And don't worry about memorizing these things, but just generally remembering these two numbers tends to be helpful. Because when you configure, for instance, your mail client, be it Outlook or Eudora, sometimes you'll be asked, what is your SMTP server? And you might have to ask Comcast or Verizon for the name or the fully qualified domain name of your SMTP server. And then usually in that same window will be a box in which you can type the port. 25 is the default. But because there exist things like firewalls, it's not uncommon for companies or for individuals to run these same services on different ports. And the curious thing here is that most companies, for instance, the ones you work for, do tend to let traffic on port 80 through, right? Because that just means web behavior. And even though they might let, not let you visit sketchy websites from work by filtering the actual content, generally they do let all web traffic through. But they might block AOL Instant Messenger. They might block SSH. But it turns out, and we'll talk about this tonight, there are some neat tricks you can do intuitively. If you are behind a corporate network that only lets port 80 through, the suggestion of which is that only, you can only use the web, how might you, as an engineer, leverage that fact and nonetheless get around these corporate restrictions and access, for instance, an email server outside on port 25? Yeah. So good. So uh, the simplest solution just is the intuition will just change the port that your service is running on. Even though we've said that these are the standard ports, that's useful for convention in the world. But there's nothing stopping you from just overriding that, especially if it's your own server. You can also set up what's called a proxy. And we'll come back to that tonight, which essentially means you can send all of your traffic to one port and let that machine or that computer figure out what ports to actually send it to. And as time permits, I'll relate to you the experience I've had even helping a friend who was working for his company in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, for a few months. And they, where he was corporately and also I think in the entire country, they had firewalls outside of the country a la China that prohibited the uh, delivery of certain kinds of traffic and certain websites. Well, being a you know, Harvard grad, he was particularly eager to exercise freedom of speech, albeit in the... Middle East and access whatever content he wanted. Nothing sketchy I, I requested of him. But being here at Harvard, I helped him set up what was called exactly that, a proxy server, whereby he simply accessed this proxy server. And by going through this proxy server, he could access anything he wanted. Moreover, we set up the proxy server in such a way that it was encrypted so that, moreover, no one within that country or even this country could even see what he was doing. And that was useful, too, because then you couldn't even filter on the content that was being sent back and forth. And so I mentioned this, one, as sort of a technical aside and curiosity, but two, to say that no matter what governments or companies set up in the interest of restricting people from doing certain things, almost always there are ways around this. And sometimes the only ways to truly prevent such uh, 
Deception is to use, you know, as the example I gave a couple weeks ago, Harvard's ad board, right? If you can't stop kids technologically from sniffing each other's traffic, well, if you catch them, just expel them and sort of raise the penalty high enough such that you don't really need a technological solution. But tonight, we're talking about technological solutions to these kinds of problems. So with that said, what is a firewall all about? Well, consider your typical home network. You might have your PC sitting at home, and you might have, uh, let's see, I'm not the artist here, your laptop here, and your PC and your laptop are going to be connected to some central point in your house, assuming you have a cable modem or DSL modem, which most of you tend to have. So we'll say that this is your modem, doesn't matter the technology. It's connected somehow or other to the internet, which we'll represent as a capital I in a cloud. The computer is presumably wired to this router. And so actually, I left something out, didn't I? So that's a modem. Let's create the router here. So this is your router. But per our conversation in like lecture five, routers these days, as you would buy them for your home, come with so much more functionality. What else do these routers do? Or what else might you call them aptly? Uh, it's a switch, usually. And the, by switch, we simply mean a box that has usually four at least Ethernet ports that just switch, uh, splits the connection. So you can connect multiple wires to it. What else are these things? Uh, not hub. Switch and hub are generally mutually exclusive. And the switch is the better of the two because it's smart. It doesn't broadcast your incoming data to everyone. A switch only sends it to the guy for whom the data is uh, intended. And this, we said last week, discourages packet sniffing. But I've omitted, as bad as my drawings tend to be, I've still omitted one salient feature of these home routers, as most of you now have them. Yeah, wireless. So little bunny ear antennas on top, which make these things an access point as well. And I also said in Lecture 5 that these router switch slash access point are also firewalls. Well, what does that mean? Well, when you pull up the internet on either of these computers, and we'll assume that this laptop itself is connected wirelessly to this router slash switch slash access point, clearly all requests for internet data go through this point and into the internet cloud. And then all responses come back to the router switch access point here and then get delivered to the appropriate machine. So in this picture, where might be the perfect place intuitively to insert some kind of protective filter? It's always a leading question. Right, so in this router, and I'll just start calling it a router for simplicity, but realize it does all of these things. But if you have this central point through which all of your data is going out and coming back in, why not insert some intelligence there that does whatever kind of filtration you want? And even though I've drawn this or described this as a home network, Think of this left side as representing maybe 20 computers, 100 computers, all of which are in your university or corporation. Similarly, would your corporation have some kind of switch and or router and or wireless access points in the building? They probably cost more than the $20 ones you would buy for your home, but in spirit, they work exactly the same. And what corporations generally do on these things is actually impose some kinds of filters. Well, technologically speaking, how could, what would you want to do in this device to prevent ev all the children in your home, for instance, everyone in your home, from using AOL Instant Messenger? Putting your engineering hats on, what would you have to do technologically here to prevent Instant Messenger traffic from going back and forth? Block it using the firewall. And let's dive a little deeper. What do you mean by blocking it using the firewall? So tell the firewall not to accept this program. And how do we identify AOL as a program? By Perfect. By its port number. Anyone know the port number for AOL Instant Messenger? Well, so this is a good exercise, because this is not an uncommon thing for you to want to do in your home network, either to block such traffic, though perhaps more common in home networks is to actually allow certain traffic, doing something called port forwarding, which we'll come back to in a moment. But suppose you have a question these days, right? Let's say AOL Instant Messenger port. And let's see if within five seconds we can see, yep, that the port for AOL Instant Messenger is 5 one 
0.90, much higher than these. But think of it this way. Internet has been around for a while, and some of these standards have been around for a while. AOL Instant Messenger less so. So again, just intuitively, it makes sense that these newer services tend to have higher numbered default ports. Yeah? No. Uh, are there an indefinite amount numbers of ports? No. I believe 16-bit values are used for TCP's port numbers. And we could confirm this by looking back at that fairly scary slide in our second internet lecture that depicted the layout of a TCP datagram. And I think, if I'm getting this right, it's only 16 bits. And if you only have 16 bits for some value, roughly how many different values can you represent? You were required to remember this for your exam. Roughly. Oh, no, not 4 billion. That was 32 bits. The reason why I only asked you to remember, remember three numbers in this class. You got one of them, sort of. What's this one? 16 bits. Good, 65,000, right? 65,536. So let, let's do a bit of review, right? We even did this in Jeopardy. So 2 to the 8 is what? 256, that's easy. 2 to the 16th. 65, that, and then it fades from there, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, 2 to the 24th, we said, was roughly a million. And then 2 to the 32? Roughly 4 billion. Yes, now you say it with confidence. Good. So unnecessary information, but that we've somehow asked you to remember, and it doesn't seem to sink in. So we'll keep trying. So if uh, that is to say there's only 65,000 or so ports that are allowed, frankly, that's more than enough. The only ones that are officially reserved for very standard services are the ones below 1024. So pretty much numbers up beyond that, the world just generally agrees on some standard, but there's no central authority that requires the enforcement of those numbers. Why does Joe Schmo's website not have a specific port number, but AOL, I So why does Joe Schmo's website not have a specific port number? So if you want your own website to be accessible by a layperson, you want to run it on some standard port. Because by default, Internet Explorer, for instance, when you pull up HTTP colon slash slash, it assumes you want port 80. If Joe Schmo were to run his website on any other port, you, the visitor, would have to know that port number and specify it. And we haven't done this in here before, but what you need to do if you want to specify a port number in something like Internet Explorer, and I'm pulling up WordPad to show you in big font, not because this should be used to visit web pages. Uh, HTTP colon slash slash cnn.com colon 80 would be equivalent in most browsers to visiting just that. You'll occasionally on the web, though, see web servers being run on non-standard ports. 8080 is one that people tend to use. You could use 1234 if you just wanted to have a bit of obscurity to your website. If you had some kind of administrative interface that even though it's password protected and everything else, you don't want it to be a target of potential hacker attacks, you might just, for a slight bit of additional security, run it on a non-standard port. If, by contrast, you're running your site via HTTPS, which we said last week means what? It's secure. It's using that protocol called SSL. Well, SSL's standard port, which the world has agreed on, is 443. So why all these ports? Why might they be actually be useful to you? So for the typical user with these home routers, you're not going to be packet filtering, most likely. And you're going to be a really tech-savvy parent, frankly, if you're prohibiting your kids from running AOL Instant Messenger during certain hours of the day. With that said, even these $20 routers these days often come with so-called parental controls that let you do exactly that. And they have tried to dumb them down by allowing you with a menu to choose what services you want to block so that you, the parent, don't need to know any of these numbers. But underneath the hood, all it's doing is saying, if I say don't allow port 5190 through between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m., what that's doing is it's configuring the software in the router to say if you get data coming in or going out that's using TCP port 5190, just drop it. So just tear up the packet and don't let it go through. And that's, in fact, what would be happening in a firewall. Yeah? But if your kid's smart enough, can't they do what you talked about earlier, change it to like 80? Absolutely. So if your kid's smart enough, couldn't the kid just change it somehow? Well, the short answer is yes. But the more technical answer is 
you need the help of someone on the outside, so to speak, because you can't change the port AOL is using. But what you could do, for instance, is call up, you need what's called a proxy server, actually. So if you had little Timmy, your best friend down the street, who has his own computer on the Internet, and his parents are not so savvy, they are not restricting any of his traffic, well, Timmy could be running a server on port 80 as though he's running a web server. But it doesn't need to actually be a web server. It can be a proxy server. And if you or your child sets up their computer in the right way, essentially saying, any Internet traffic I send should not go directly to the Internet, but rather should go to Timmy's computer on port 80, Timmy's computer will be set up to port forward, so to speak. Any traffic that comes in out on the normal port, it's going to go to its destination. It's going to come then back to Timmy's computer, and Timmy's computer is then going to be responsible for forwarding it back. And in effect, this is exactly what I did with my friend who was in Dubai. I was Timmy in that situation. Should have chosen a better name. But all of his traffic from Dubai was going through my server, then going out onto the Internet, and then it was going back through my server and back to his computer. Of course, being that I was therefore a man in the middle, there was clearly the potential for me or little Timmy to do what? mess with his information, log all of the websites he's visiting, read all of the emails he was sending. But we were sort of did this on a uh, trust basis. But you have to realize that often with technological solutions come potential costs. Now, the first cost of which is obviously you need someone on the outside to be doing this. But you've never seen a smarter bunch of kids. If you find the geeks in your local high school who are trying to use the Internet from their library and want to circumvent all the, uh, the restrictions, it's not hard, I'm sure, to even get around school systems, especially when, I mean, truth be told, most of the IT folks in, in public schools these days certainly are the librarians who might have installed the software that they were given. But if you know this level of detail and you're 12 years old, 16 years old, it's going to be hard to uh, outdo these kids if they're determined to you know, download the latest widgets and you know, flash-based animation games. So it's doable. So with that said, firewall blocks the data that you might want uh, to keep out of your network or to block from going out of your network, as in the case of AOL Instant Messenger. Proxy servers in spirit do exactly what we described with little Timmy, but why else might these numbers be useful to you? Well, how many of you have ever tried to use something like AOL Instant Messenger, but not just for IMing, but for sending files via direct connection? or used Skype or Google Talk or any of those voice over IP programs whereby you wanted to establish either a direct connection for files or for voice or for video. So a few of you, how many of you have tried this with some friends and had it fail? Just times out, doesn't work. So why might that be? And this is incredibly common, the more common these kinds of firewalls or routers become. Imagine if you here, like we were doing with Victor, Kahyaho that day from the typical PC user podcast. We had set up a video conference. Even though I wasn't using my camera, he was sending video to us. Well, that worked very easily for us those, that day because I was not behind a firewall. I was on Harvard's network, which for the most part lets almost everything through. Victor similarly was on a network that let most everything through. But more common for you and for me when I'm at home is for me and you to be behind a firewall. And equivalently, is it common for your friends to be behind a firewall? Well, the problem with things like sending files via instant messenger or using audio or video is that you're starting to transfer a lot of data. And AOL is already hugely popular for instant messaging, although their you know, ISP is tanking. But if it's that popular and they already have to send all these instant messages, what's the problem if now people want to be able to send files and video and voice through AOL Instant Messenger? You need very much bigger pipes for, for AOL Instant Messenger. But does AOL Instant Messenger nearly, really need to pay for that bandwidth, for the hardware to support this, right? Even E1 has been paying to provide its podcast because we needed for a while to pay someone to give us the bandwidth we needed, upwards of one or two terabytes per month. Oh, and I, I promise to do this. Um, we are no longer paying for our bandwidth since the kind folks at switchpod.com have kindly offered to host E1's uh, podcast uh, gratis for us for the coming year. So many thanks to switchpod.com, and we encourage you all to visit switchpod.com as well as to drink Coca-Cola. <laughs> so <laughs> um, with that said, 
it's just silly for AOL Instant Messenger to be receiving and retransmitting all of your video content and all of your audio content if they can avoid it. Right? Your instant messages, meanwhile, have always been going through some central server. So as an aside, if you're ever doing sketchy things over instant messenger or talking about building bombs or generally things that are frowned upon, don't do it over AOL instant messenger because theoretically they could be logging absolutely everything. Back to the story at hand. If you want to engage in voice over IP or exchange video conferencing with some person and you're both behind firewalls, what does that imply about each of your IP addresses? So they're basically the same, but they're technically private, or as we've said, fake IP addresses, right? Because when you're behind one of these routers, your router does have a real IP address assigned from your ISP via your modem. But the same goes true for your friend on the other side who has a similar setup. But your individual computers, the laptop and desktop, have phony IPs. 192.168.something is the typical form. The problem is is when you want to exchange video or audio content, you have a sort of chicken and the egg problem, whereby your computer, if it's not going to go through AOL, needs to make a direct connection to your friend's computer. But you don't know the real IP address of your friend's computer because it's hidden behind that firewall. Similarly, does your friend not know yours because you too are have a phony IP address, or private IP address, as they're more properly called, that could be anything behind this router. And so, what some instant messaging programs like uh, Skype and Google Talk are very good at, and AOL Instant Messenger and MSN Messenger are less good at, at least as of recent years, is figuring out a way around that. And long story short, when this does actually work, there exist special tricks that the world has adopted. STUN is the name of a protocol that is a language that programs can speak and the trick essentially in spirit works like this. Both computers sort of guess where the other one is and start transmitting simultaneously. And this will often work through firewalls such that the traffic is allowed through when typically it would not be. And if you're curious for more technical detail, just pull up STUN on Wikipedia. And there's a really nice article there, for instance. So sometimes you have friends for, with whom you can start a direct connection, but they can't to you. It, that's likely a function of who's behind the firewall and exactly what the firewall is doing or what the, network, the ISP is allowing through. So just tough to answer more specifically than that. But the relevance to us is the following. Now suppose that you're not just trying to do these kinds of direct connections, but you want to connect to your computer from another computer of your own. For instance, what I do all the time now is I use this thing that comes with Windows called Remote Desktop Connection. And this just lets me literally connect to and control my PC in my apartment. So for instance, earlier, before we started rolling film, you all were treated to a good half hour of The Daily Show. Not the John Hodgman segment, but those of you who came early saw a good half hour of The Daily Show, and that was being streamed via the equivalent of Remote Desktop to this lecture hall from my apartment. Well, what remote desktop that comes with Windows lets you do is not only stream content, but literally control things. And if I've never said it before, the reason that I have such bland desktops like this, right, a black background with the word laptop in gray at top right, is because I get confused myself. I so often connect to my different computers that I sort of need to be told what computer I'm connected to. Because if you use remote desktop, you literally see your desktop and your start menu and your um, my computer as though you were actually sitting in front of it. And the only fundamental difference is that you'll often feel that it's slower than actually sitting in front of it, obviously because you have a network in between you and it. However, this requires that one, if I want to connect to my apartment right now, I need to know my apartment's IP address, which is step one, but I also need to do a little trick. If I want to connect to my desktop, which is the one I normally connect to, and I'm out here, well, I might know the IP address of this guy. But what's going to happen when I say I want to connect via remote desktop to IP address, say, 1234? That request is going to arrive at my router, and what's he going to do with it? Well, he, the router will have been previously already assigned an IP address to my desktop, presumably when I booted my desktop up. But for instance, suppose I do have multiple computers in my apartment. In fact, I have six now, I think. How does the router know to which computer to route this incoming request if the only means via which I can identify my apartment 
is via its publicly accessible IP. Well, how would you do it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, how would you do it anyway? We'll put you on the spot. All the tools you need to know or the knowledge has been discussed in some form tonight. The goal, again, is when I'm sitting here at this computer and I initiate remote desktop connection to my apartment by way of its IP address, how can my router know to whom it should send this incoming request? What might I want to do? Each computer OK. OK, so not bad. So each computer will have be called ABC, or let's just say each has its own private IP address. Well, all I have to do in advance is configure my router to do what I mentioned earlier. It's called port forwarding. And that name kind of says it all. What you can do is hard code into your home router. And you can do this yourself if you want to start doing this with remote desktop. You just have to tell your router, always send requests on port 3389, I believe it is, to computer A. That is to say, send it always to computer with IP address 192.168.1.10, for instance. And if you hard code that into your router, and you assume that your desktop's computer's IP address is hard coded as well, which you can easily do, or you can tell your router to always give it the same IP address. Henceforth, any time I try to connect to my apartment from any computer on the internet, any requests on port 3389 reach the router. The router says, oh, I'm supposed to forward this specifically to this computer. And then I'll be able to connect directly to that computer. What I was actually showing you earlier when we played a whole good half hour of the Daily Show was a little toy of mine that we've used before. How was I streaming Comcast's cable modem to this lecture hall? That way. <laughs> that way, yes. Sort of. What was the toy called? It's like $100, $200 these days, worth the investment. Slingbox. Yes? No? Tough crowd? Yeah. We can review tapes, and I can prove to you that I've said these things before. Slingbox. So remember I did this analogy. Whereas TiVo is the sort of time-shifting device, lets you record something and watch it later, Slingbox is a device that lets you record something on, say, your TiVo, but watch it not only later, but elsewhere. So essentially, I have a little computer called the Slingbox in my apartment that's connected to my Comcast cable box, and it's also connected to my home network. So I've got a little device at home that looks like a trapezoid. It, too, is connected to my router. It, too, has a private IP address. And Slingbox operates on port 5001, I think. So I've simply configured my router in addition to saying remote desktop should go here. That is, 3389 should be mapped here. Well, I've also said that port 5001 should be mapped here. And what that means is I can also connect to my Slingbox via the internet by just connecting to my publicly accessible IP address. So one more question here. And I've clearly moved away from security and I've started talking about things in my apartment, but that's OK. So how do you know what your own IP address is? How do I know what my apartment's IP address is? So you can always go on your computer to the Run menu. But if you do this, as I'll do here, and type IP config on a PC, it's a little small. But I'm currently connected to E1's router here. And unfortunately, just I'm simulating my apartment here, just not with as many cool toys or big TVs. But this thing has given me a private IP address. And it's this router that's connected to Harvard's network. So I just found out my private IP address, but that's not sufficient, right? I need to know the IP of this thing. Well, <laughs> this is a neat trick that is not a function of the internet. It's just a clever website. Right? When in doubt, what do you do these days? What is my IP address? Now, this would be weird if a website could tell you what your IP address is, because that suggests the website knows the IP address of everyone on the internet. But what happens when you visit any website, have we said? You're sending information to a server. That virtual envelope that you send to the web server, inside of that virtual envelope, not only is the request for, hey, give me your web page, but also your return address. That is your IP address. And one of the most useful websites on the internet is this one. What is my IP address? And it will tell you what your IP address is. And notice, this is different from what I just saw with IP config. Because what does my IP address look like to the outside world? It looks like the IP address of this thing, or equivalently this thing. Only inside my apartment does that 192.168 address 
actually get used. The outside world knows nothing about it. So what I could now do if I really wanted, if I knew that for the sake of discussion, this was, if I knew my IP address was, let's say, uh, 25.43.67.9, suppose I knew in advance, because earlier today I had sat down in my apartment, gone to whatismyipaddress.com, it had told me, I'd written it down. Now that I'm at Harvard, if I want to connect to my computers, I can just type that in, hit enter. Via port forwarding, will my request go to the right computer? There's only one problem with this. What do you know about IP addresses as they're assigned by ISPs? They can change. They're not often changing these days. The dial-up, they'll change all the time. But if you have dial-up, you don't want to try controlling your PC via the internet anyway. You can't certainly watch TV via streaming video. But if your IP address might change occasionally and you're traveling or generally you're relying on this ability to connect, that's problematic. And one of the neat things that you can do to solve this, and this is one thing that I use, there is a website called DynDNS, for dynamicdns.com. And if you go to this site, one of their services you'll see, and there are others that do this, if you go to this link here, Dynamic DNS, a free DNS service for those with dynamic IP addresses, which is almost everyone, you can essentially sign up for a free account, and it will give you a username like David Malin, and it'll give you a password, and then all you have to do is install free software on any of the computers in your network, and only one of them. So you can download a little Windows program here. You configure that Windows program with the username and password that you got for free, and what that little program does every day, every few hours, is it just contacts DynDNS.org just saying, hello, and it says, hello, from David Malin. But because it's making an internet request of DynDNS's server, what is included implicitly in that request? IP the IP address. So what this informs DynDNS of effectively is what David Malin's current IP address is. And what that allows me to do is that what my username does is it doesn't just allow me to run that software. It also allows me to visit, say, David Malin dot DynDNS org, and I can type that into remote desktop, or I can type that into my Slingbox software, and effectively, because of the way the internet works, this will get converted to an IP address with the help of DynDNS's DNS server, and a DNS server, recall, we didn't spend much time on it, simply converts IP addresses to fully qualified domain names, back and forth. So with this layer of indirection, does DynDNS then tell my computer what my current IP address is? And so in this way, do I never even need to know what my IP address is? The little special free software just constantly updates it. And 99% of the time, you'll be able to connect, assuming that thing updates itself often enough. It's a wonderful resource. And if you've never used uh, remote desktop on Windows, and you can do this on Mac OS and other operating systems as well, on a PC, it's as simple as going to your system control panel, going to remote, and clicking allow users to remotely connect to this computer if you've set up, say, port forwarding in your router, if you're doing this at home. But now we can tie this back into tonight's lecture. As soon as you check that box and click OK, what are you now running the risk of? Uh, worms, potentially. If the remote desktop software that Microsoft wrote has a bug in it that allows someone with the right type of packet to essentially infect your computer, absolutely. You've just made yourself vulnerable simply by allowing connections to begin with. What else might be problematic? Oh, you got to stop sitting like this, I think. <laughs> what else might be problematic? So other people can find you, or more worrisomely, other people can potentially connect to your computer. Right? How many of you have a password of 1234? Well, if your username is David Malin and your password is just 1234, it's not going to take a hack or very long to just guess your password. So again, there's a trade-off here, convenience of the accessibility of your computers and your files but versus the trade-off, the security threats that you potentially render yourself vulnerable to. And there are ways to tweak remote desktops so that, for instance, after three bad passwords, it will just lock you out for five minutes. That can at least discourage a hacker from just pounding on your machine with a whole bunch of randomly generated passwords. Questions? Huh? All right, let's go ahead and take a five-minute break. All right.
right, so we're back. So another defense, another way of keeping people out, but still letting things in that you want to come in. How many of you are familiar with the term of VPN? Yeah, all right, so what's a VPN? What's it good for? Virtual private network, good. Yeah, a lot of offices use it, businesses. Hospital, certainly. So what's typically useful is to keep everything out of your network. That is, of course, the most secure land to maintain. But it's certainly useful to let some things into your network, right? Traveling salespeople might want to gain access to your local file servers. Maybe they need to get access to the intranet, you know, just a website that only people in the company are supposed to be able to access. Well. You could certainly try just password protecting everything and so forth, but more secure is if you could somehow let people in your company at other locations, be it in their hotels whilst traveling, or be it at other offices that you might maintain elsewhere in the country or elsewhere in the city, wouldn't it be nice if you could sort of link multiple networks or individual travelers with your own primary network in such a way that you have all the protections in place, but you allow them a secure tunnel, so to speak, into your network. Well, that's exactly what a VPN is. A virtual private network creates the illusion between a network and a user that that user is actually on that network. And it creates a tunnel in the sense that all of the traffic from, say, the traveling salesperson's laptop is encrypted, sent to the company, to the firewall effectively, or more specifically to the VPN server at the company where it's decrypted, and then it's forwarded along to say the company's file server or database or intranet site or whatever, whatever medium they're trying to access. How do you use uh, VPN software? Well, Harvard actually has a VPN. Harvard has a VPN software that I don't have installed on this computer. But if I did, imagine a screen that came up and it said, enter your username, enter your password, hit enter. And it really should be as seamless as that. Um, Harvard has a VPN so that people off campus can connect to on-campus resources. If you've ever tried to download some of Harvard's software, it's what's called Keyed, with a program called Key Server or Key Access. And what this means is that you can only, for instance, use some of Harvard's software that they license for your use if you're on campus. Well, the more mobile people have become, and what with distance education and all, that doesn't sort of fly if a lot of your students can't physically access the campus to begin with. So what Harvard offers is a VPN, uh, vpn.fas.harvard.edu. You can download the VPN software for free from FAS's website. And what this allows, say, a distance student to do is to connect to Harvard's campus be given a Harvard IP address, 140.247.something, and then appear to the outside world as being in harvard.edu, even if they might be in at some Marriott halfway across the world. The downside, potentially, is that if you're connected to a VPN, usually all of your internet traffic, whilst you're connected to that VPN, goes through your company server. So if you're sitting in your hotel room and you're connected to your company's VPN using your company's VPN software, well, odds are those instant messages you're sending to friends back home, the emails you're sending, the web pages you're pulling up, even though you're in the Marriott, it's possible and it's common that all of that data similarly would be routed through your company back out through their internet connection, back through the company on the way back, and then back to the Marriott. So beware when you're connected to things like VPNs, because they will sort of usurp your internet connection and start controlling it for as long as you're connected to the VPN. But it's a useful thing if you want to gain or provide people with secure access to otherwise protected resources. But that's all it is. It's encryption between points A and B. And that, too, is sort of a good segue to this topic, that of cryptography. So cryptography is just the art or the science or the method of encrypting or scrambling data. Scrambled above you is a phrase. What is this phrase? In other words, can you decrypt this phrase for us? Let's turn up here if we could. So there's a bit of a clue there. Below this encrypted phrase is what appears to be uh, Radio Orphan Annie's SS something or other. What is this? 
unless you continue to hack away, perhaps, on paper, I will seed you with some hints. So this is an example of a Caesar cipher, uh, the legend being that Caesar, back in the day, used a Caesar cipher to encrypt communications between his um, army uh, personnel and so forth. I find this hard to believe, though, because of all of the ciphers or encryption mechanisms, the Caesar cipher is perhaps one of the dumbest ones or easiest to break. Granted, if the world had never seen cryptography before, it perhaps doesn't matter how easy the thing is to break if no one's even thought of how to break it in the first place. But what the Caesar cipher simply does is it takes, let's say for the sake of our discussion, the English alphabet, 26 letters, and it rotates them some number of places. It uses a key. Uh, that key is just a number from 1 to 26. So if your secret key is 13, that means that you simply rotate the letters in the alphabet by 13 places. So that is to say, if I tell you that this has been encrypted with a Caesar cipher using a key of 13, can you tell me now what this thing decrypts to? In other words, just rotate the letters in the other direction, 13 places. And obviously, if you rotate past Z, just flip around to A. Hence the circle. That's what the circle is getting at. Anyone? You'll be hugely disappointed when you find out what it is. Just as disappointed as little Ralphie was in a Christmas story, perhaps? Yes, be sure to drink your Ovaltine is in fact the answer. So a Christmas story, which will soon be on stations like TNT, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, has little Ralphie saving up, I think, like uh, um, cereal box tops for months because he wants to send them in and get a, I think it's a Captain Midnight secret decoder ring with which he can finally decode the message that's been delivered to him on each and every one of his cereal boxes. Unfortunately, once he's lucky enough to collect all of the box tops or whatever and get his secret decoder ring by mail, he sits down and very anxiously and in this very tense movement in the movie, decrypts the secret message. And it's just an ad from Ovaltine saying, be sure to drink your Ovaltine. So I've just spoiled part of the movie for you, my apologies. But what this is for tonight's purposes is an example of a cipher. A cipher is just like an algorithm or it's a mechanism for scrambling information in a way that's reversible. Right? It's very easy to create a secure message if you just change things to random letters. But you need to be able to reverse that process. And a cipher is sort of like a mathematical formula. In this case, it's just plus 13 or minus 13. So in this case, it's very easy, which is why I find the legend hard to believe that this is what Caesar was using to um, encrypt and decrypt messages with his generals. But so goes the story. But a Caesar cipher is just an example of a general idea, which is how do you scramble information. Fortunately, the world is, gone, is much more advanced these days. Think, uh, we'll put the challenge to you. You want to come up with something less inane than a cipher like this, because you're more concerned about your data, data than, say, Caesar was, right? How long would it have taken someone to figure out what this message was? What would you do if you were to be a cryptanalyst, which is a guy or a woman who decodes messages? How do you brute force figure this thing out? Huh? Yeah, try all the different combinations, right? Add one to every letter. Does it look like English? If not, try adding two to every letter. Does it work? No, try adding three. If you know it's a Caesar cipher, it's not going to take you that long. If you know how to program, you can have a computer do it nearly instantaneously. But if you didn't know it was a Caesar cipher, you might stare at it for a while, as some of you might have done. You might have maybe just done substitutions. Maybe the most common letters should be swapped out for A, E, I, O, U, or whatever the most popular letters are in, say, um, Wheel of Fortune. The idea is sort of the same. You can do what's called a frequency analysis and just kind of infer, oh, you know what, if uh, the letter B seems to be pretty common, maybe B represents the most common letter E in the English alphabet. I think it's E. Or in this case, though, it was an actual cipher. It wasn't just the substitution of one letter for another. Web browsers and web servers do use encryption, we've said, right? What is the protocol that web servers and browsers use to encrypt and decrypt information? Yes, SSL and fading chalk on the board. SSL, secure sockets layer. This is just a mechanism for cryptography that fortunately is much, much harder to break. In fact, a lot of the actual 
ciphers in use today by computers don't use 26 letter keys, right? How many, let's translate this into computer speak. If you need to represent 26 different letters, A through Z, how many bits do you need? Let's try to put this into perspective. So what if you had three bits? With three bits, how many different values can you represent? All right, just the easy one. Two to the three. Two times two times two. Yes, eight. So if we have three bits, we can only represent eight letters. That's not enough. What if we have four bits? All right, see, this is why this stuff's relevant. It's not just esoteric knowledge. OK, 16, that's not enough. What if we have five bits? Then we can represent 32 letters. So it looks like for Caesar, all we need are keys that are five bits. So it, we need five bits. And even though that's more bits than we need, because we'll have some wasted values, this effectively means that the Caesar cipher, in, as we've seen it, uses five bit keys. Now contrast this with something like RSA, which technically is the algorithm that something like your web browser and server use. It's the algorithm that SSL itself uses. Common today are the use of keys that are, say, 128 bits. Other mechanisms for encryption will use 256 bits, even 1,024 or 2,048 bits. The faster computers get, the easier they can handle these kinds of values. Now put this into perspective. If a 5-bit key means that there's 32 possible keys, that doesn't take that long to guess for a human or a computer. Well, 5 bits. Let's round up. So suppose we use 8-bit keys. Now how much harder is the problem? How many keys might you have to guess if you're using 8-bit keys? 256, I think that's what I heard, 256. To fast forward to 32 bits. If I use 32 bit keys, how many possible guesses might I have to make to guess someone's password or secret key? So two to the 32, which is roughly, quick, check the notes. Four billion has it. So now if 32 bit keys give you four billion possible values, can you even fathom what 2 to the 1024 gives you? The takeaway being, right, you can do this if you want. So take 4 billion times 4 billion, that gives you uh, 2 to the 64. Do it again, that, it takes a while to count up to 2 to the 1024. I would wager that none of us know the word, I certainly don't, for what the value 2 to the 1024 is. And most of you probably don't have calculators that can count. That high. That's a lot of digits. But this is only to say that when computers use cryptography, it tends to be pretty strong. And unless there's a bug in the implementation of the algorithm or like the browser or the server, this is to be mathematically secure. And one of the things that the problem set actually hints at, and this is in its extra credit, is that prime numbers these days have a lot to do with the security of a lot of cryptographic algorithms. Clearly not. Uh, Caesar ciphers, but something like RSA actually, which is commonly again used by web browsers and servers as part of SSL to protect your data, it relies on it being very difficult mathematically to factor large numbers. And by factor I just mean take a big number and figure out what two numbers you have to multiply to get that number. Even for computers, if you're talking about values that are 1024 bits long, it will take m more seconds than there are atoms in the universe to determine what those two numbers is. And I kind of made that up, but it's in the right spirit. It's a lot, sort of more than is even humanly possible these days. However, one of the scary things is, even though it's a theoretical scariness, is if someone wakes up tomorrow and announces that, aha, I figured out how to factor large numbers quickly using some special fancy algorithm or maybe using quantum computers if you've ever heard of these things, that does pose a problem for the cryptography of the world because so many things like your ATM machines, your web browsers and servers, bank security, a lot of corporate security rests on algorithms like RSA which in turn make this mathematical assumption. Now whether or not that's a real threat is sort of up for debate, but when we ask you in the extra credit for problem set six to tell us what the uh, two prime numbers are that compose this big number, you'll get a sense of just how long it takes to factor a number with just, what, 10 or 20 or so digits, let alone hundreds of digits. So more on that on the problem set. But the takeaway for now is that one of the defenses against some of the bad things we've discussed, ad adversaries, hackers trying to get at your data, is clearly cryptography. And it fortunately is implemented by people 
were very typically good in the stuff, and you as the user just get to use it. You don't even have to know how it's working, but you do have to trust it. Well, what about these things? Another defense that you might install to protect against bad things. Well, what does a virus scanner do? We talked last week when Dawn brought her new computer about something like ABG, a McAfee virus scan, Norton antivirus, same thing, all of these things fundamentally. How does a virus scanner work? How does it detect viruses and worms and get rid of them? Excellent. So a virus scanner will typically search your hard drive or scan your emails or scan web pages you're visiting for known threats. Typically, a virus or worm can be uniquely identified by some sequence of bits. That is to say, if you're infected with the, the virus called XYZ, what that means is that you're infected with some piece of software that has some pattern in it. right? And it might be a few kilobytes large, but most viruses have some unique signature, we'll say whereby they start with the same pattern of zeros and ones. And simply by looking on your hard drive for, say, exactly this pattern, though probably something longer than I've written, you can determine, hey, that is the XYZ virus, because the smart people at McAfee or Norton or AVG have discovered that that is the sequence of bits that is always on someone's machine that's infected with XYZ. As soon as you detect that string of bits, well, what the software can simply do is erase them or delete the file, or tell you at least that that file is dangerous, don't open it. What's the downside of this approach? Or that is to say, are virus scanners the uh, cure for all types of malware like viruses and worms? Well, clearly not, because otherwise it wouldn't be a problem. Right? Yeah? Good. So yes, the software you bought off the shelf yesterday might protect you against all of the viruses and worms that existed yesterday. But suppose someone wakes up this morning, doesn't figure out how to break RSA, but instead writes the brand new worm or virus that ends up on the CNN news all day long because it was so effective in attacking people's computers. Well, humans typically need to take time to figure out what worms and viruses look like. This is why if you have antivirus software installed on your computer, what's it usually doing? Like, once a day. It's, yeah, so it's downloading new virus definitions or updates, whatever the company calls them, but that's just updating new signatures for new worms and viruses that have either been discovered or finally been uh, had uh, uh, vaccines, essentially, developed for them in the form of this antivirus software. Well, that implicitly already gives the bad guys a good 24-hour window to go after your computer, assuming it's even updating itself every 24 hours. Moreover, what if you had what's called a, a metamorphic or polymorphic worm? It's not a term you hear tossed around in the media, but this refers to a worm whose shape changes every time it infects a computer. That is to say, the worm partially encrypts itself, and when you encrypt something, we've seen it kind of scrambles things up. Well, if you scramble things up, we don't know what it's going to look like in advance, and that's an even more dangerous threat if you just can't protect against it, at least with this type of software. So what do most programs do? Well, the thing I don't like actually about things like Norton and McAfee, one of which was installed on Dawn's computer, you remember the pop-ups we kept getting warning me about this and that, is a lot of times these programs are behavior based. And what they do is they don't look for known patterns, but they raise red flags when something sketchy seems to be going on. Something's trying to write to your C drive, maybe. Or maybe it's write, trying to make a network connection, even though you don't have any browsers or anything open. But the problem with this kind of software is that if it has to infer from behavior that something bad might be going on, what in fact might be the case? Right. If you just downloaded Skype for the first time and you double clicked it, it's never seen Skype before, but you want to load Skype. And so what you get is this risk of false positives, as they'd be called. Um, in, in a, you'd get uh, alerts saying, hey, this is bad, when really it's not necessarily bad. And so again, it's that trade-off. Do you want your software prompting you, the user, punting the decisions to you? I mean, odds are, if you're like me, you probably just, okay, okay, I don't even understand that message, and you move on. Problem is, infection time. So again, it's a trade-off, and it's an unsolved problem that continues to plague people and probably will for some time. Well, let's consider the flip side. This is how you might protect your computer. What about the people who write software to protect your computer, or the people who write software that runs on your computer? Well, piracy is certainly an issue in the domain of security, whereby piracy refers to what? 
in the domain of computers. Yeah, sharing software, distributing software, copying software for which you don't have licenses for, for which you didn't pay for. You know, have you ever opened one of those CD envelopes and on the back of the envelope is a very small print and a sticker and as soon as you tear that sticker, you're agreeing not to steal the software or to give it to a friend. But I bet if we did a little anonymous survey, we would come up with a non-zero number of people here who are running software that they didn't pay for and yet somehow it's on their computer or maybe you have a friend who equivalently is running something, hey, you paid for. Well, the thing is that it's very easy generally to copy software, right? It's just bits. So what do companies usually do to discourage people from copying software? Well, you get things like this, right? How many of you have installed software that requires that you type in a sequence of letters or numbers to actually install it? So that certainly one way of discouraging it because now not only does someone have to download the software, they also have to know this semi-secret number. Well, you can take the fifth if you want. How many of you have also shared that secret number with a friend or said, here, do with this what you will? Well, CD keys don't necessarily protect the software in any real way. All right, so what else can the companies do? Well, product activation, as it's called. Microsoft is doing this more with Windows, whereby to register your, your software, not only do you have to type in the secret code, you also need to make a network connection to Microsoft. And Microsoft essentially then records some information about your computer that officially is not personally identifying, but does somehow identify your computer uniquely. And what they then do is if someone else tries to register that same copy of Windows or Office on some other computer and the information from that computer doesn't match your own, red flag goes up. And either the software won't install or you'll be informed, we're finding this suspicious. You can only install this software three more times, for instance. That's a common approach companies are taking. The software installation expires after a while. If you ever experience this, though, um, you might have the following problem. If you're like me, sometimes you might format your computers or maybe you'd add a piece of hardware to your computer and you can certainly create a situation legally in which you've just changed your computer such that it looks different enough now to Microsoft that they think you're installing the software on another computer. So this too is sort of a fundamental problem. Oftentimes though it suffices to call the number that's on the screen and their screening process is essentially that they assume that if someone's taking the time to call Microsoft's 800 number to explain that this is a legit piece of software, can you please tell me how to install it, odds are that's not a malicious person doing this and revealing their phone number and so forth. So you can usually work around this. But the point is, it's a nuisance. So what about what's in the media all, these, all the time now? Music. Similarly, quite pirated these days, illegally copied, movies even more so. What are companies like Apple doing when you download music and you've paid for it to prevent you from giving it to someone else? Have you ever tried buying a song from, say, iTunes for 99 cents and then giving it to someone else? Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? <laughs> All right, what happens? Good. So what Apple does and what other companies are starting to use is this big buzzword, DRM, digital rights management, which just means nuisance for most people, especially people who use multiple computers and multiple devices for whom it's very reasonable to want to play your brand new MP3 on your iPod or your PC desktop or your laptop or maybe take it with you elsewhere. DRM is sort of an interesting approach that the music and uh, video industry has now taken. It's very similar in spirit to all the hoops that the software industry has tried to make people jump through. Uh, whether or not this persists remains to be seen. But as you know, what you have to do with stuff like stuff, stuff that you download from iTunes is you have to log in to Apple's server in order to listen to that music. Or you can copy it to your iPod, but only to your iPod. And for the most part, it's proved very difficult to circumvent Apple's uh, protections, though inevitably all such ciphers or protections do tend to get broken. In fact, so, um, I think it was Sony, though it was some company, maybe Sony, that a couple of years ago installed similar DRM type software on their CDs so that they didn't want people copying 
either their music or data CDs. I forget which it was. Within days of these disks being released to the world, someone figured out how to copy these copy-protected CDs. How'd they do it? Yeah? I thought it was black, but same idea. So we'll go with either. So they took, <laughs> it was as simple as this. The way they had protected the data was to put the protections essentially on the outside of the CD. So we know about the, what are they called, the lands and grooves. It's sort of like a phonograph record. So they used the outside part of the disk to store zeros and ones that collectively constituted some kind of copy protection. Turns out with a black or maybe green Sharpie marker, just cover that line of the disk over, put it into your computer, bam, copyable. It's kind of amazing, and you can only imagine how many man hours went into developing that cryptography, and it was defeated by a Sharpie marker. And there are many stories of similarly silly um, protections being defeated. How many of you had a kryptonite lock for your bike that needed to be replaced? So how many of you have seen the video on the web whereby a guy took a 20-cent Bic pen, popped off the end, so you just get a plastic cylinder, wedge the thing in there, and turn really hard, bam, you've just opened an $80 lock for free. It cost them a fortune, I'm sure. And I was actually really disappointed. I had one of the locks that was supposedly vulnerable, and I hurt the hell out of my hand trying to get the pen into the lock, and I could not break my own lock. I was very disappointed. But they did replace it for free. But same idea. So that is to say, even though you might put your faith in some of these defenses, with enough time, money, spare time, people will all, almost always figure out how to circumvent these things. But so far as the industry is concerned, a lot of these measures are intended simply to raise the bar and increase the cost of actually cracking into things. Well, lastly, what can you do to protect your own data in the event you decide to give your computer to someone? or you decide to take it to Best Buy and you don't want them looking at whatever financial files or sketchy files you have on your computer. We use the term sketchy and sketchy files a lot in this class, but so be it. So why is this a concern? Well, if you hand your computer over to someone on eBay and sell it, or you bring it to a service technician, well, they clearly have access to your computer. You might think, well, I have a password, a username and password. Well, we said last week that you know, with the right software and savvy, not so hard to get rid of Malin's password on your computer. In short, if you have physical access to a machine, you have access to the data. And it doesn't take a huge amount of savvy to figure out how to get at it. So what can you do beforehand if you're selling a computer? Well, just highlight everything on your C drive, drag it to the recycle bin, and then what? All right, delete it. Does that solve your problem? Can you then sell it safely on eBay? No? All right. So, no. Well, let's take it one step further before we answer the why behind that. Well, what if we not only erase the files like that, we quote unquote format the hard drive by using like a boot CD or a floppy disk to boot into a little blinking DOS prompt and type format, enter. Does that do it? Formatting is sort of a thing of the past, at least so far as typical users go. But the answer is no. So let's consider the deletion one. If you go and drag every darn file from your computer into the recycle bin and remember to empty the recycle bin, why are you arguing that that is not sufficient to protect? It's still in your hard drive. How is that? I thought I deleted it. Yeah. Good. So you're basically saying that the space formerly occupied by the files you've quote unquote deleted, are simply available for use by new files. They're not actually removed. So if we think back to our hardware lectures, recall that a hard drive has one or more of these platters inside of it. And on each of these platters is you know, magnetic particles of some sort. And a file that takes up a megabyte or a kilobyte might take up this much of the hard disk. And here are just zeros and ones, but they'd physically be some kind of magnetic particles. Well, this is, for instance, my resume. resume dot doc, and it happens to refer to those bits. And you might have other files similarly referenced elsewhere. Well, when a computer saves a file, the means by which it remembers what file is where is by way of a table, essentially. And that table, quite simply, or in simple form, has two columns. One is the name, and the second column is the location. And you might have in this column, resume dot doc, 
And over here, you might have uh, the address 1, 2, 3, 4. And what that just refers to, for instance, is the 1,234th bit on the disk, or the equivalent thereof. So when you go and drag something to the recycle bin, you probably know that that clearly is not sufficient, because it's just in the recycle bin. But when you empty the recycle bin, what actually happens? It erases that. But what does that mean about your resume? All of the zeros and ones are still there. And they're only going to be overwritten by different patterns of zeros and ones if your operating system and hard drive decide to reuse that space. Most operating systems do not proactively overwrite those bits with, say, random bits or maybe all zeros. Although Mac OS, at least, uh, Mac OS 10.4 does have an option called Secure Empty Trash, which does erase this and that. But even most Mac users, I would, I would hypothesize, don't know that that exists, or they don't know that they should use it in the interests of their own privacy. So what does this mean? Well, this means if you're adding, downloading files and saving files and erasing them via the recycle bin, you're leaving, you're leaving remnants all over the place. And one of the things we used to do at the district attorney's office when a new hard drive would come in for forensic analysis is just run software that knowing that there's going to be a lot of deleted files on there, it just scours not this table, because this table has had entries removed, but it just looks at all the zeros and ones on the platters. And it looks for patterns in them, similar in spirit to what a virus scanner would do. Because beyond files being identified in the Windows world with file extensions like doc or .jpg or .gif, well, each of those file formats similarly is defined by a unique pattern of zeros and ones at the start of it and sometimes at the end of it. Which is to say that just by looking for the right patterns of zeros and ones, you can find all of the JPEGs that have been downloaded to that computer, even if they were in your internet cache and subsequently erased by Internet Explorer. You can find all of the Word documents that were on the computer, even if they've been proactively emptied from the recycle bin. And in the worst case, maybe some of the bits get overwritten, right? The operating system might decide, you know what, I need this amount of space. But it doesn't need those bits yet, so you might get 50% of a file back, or you'll get half of a JPEG showing up on the screen. But depending on your goals, that may very well be sufficient. The short of it is that deleting files is non-trivial. Moreover, even if you proactively, securely empty your trash on, say, Mac OS or on other operating systems with special software, you can still have traces of files elsewhere. Can anyone think, based on conversations we had in, say, lectures, does it even matter if I tell you which lecture it was from? <laughs> even if we, uh, if we discussed this material in, say, lectures one and two, back in our hardware lectures, um, where are we going with this? Oh, where else on your computer might there be remnants of files that you have loaded into memory, RAM, besides where they're physically stored on your hard drive? Ah. Excellent. Virtual memory. So what was virtual memory back in lecture one or two? I'm sorry? RAM, uh, elaborate. What do we mean by It's not quite like RAM, so what is it with respect to RAM? What's virtual memory? It's an extension. Perfect. So it was this use of hard disk space as though it were RAM. You use virtual memory so that you can generally run more programs at once, right? Remember that pipeline we had that led from the hard drive to RAM to L2 to L1 cache to the CPU? Well, we said sometimes if you can't fit everything into RAM, which is the fastest place to be, the computer will punt some of your programs back to disk. And this is why sometimes your computer will feel slow, especially when you're toggling between programs, because they're being loaded from disk and into RAM and back and forth. Well, a lot of programs, including programs that so-called scrub your hard drive, fail to scrub all locations on your hard drive that data might have been. So when we've talked about virtual memory, what we're really talking about is the fact that part of your hard drive is reserved for virtual memory by Mac OS or by Windows. And unbeknownst to you and out of your control, some files might end up elsewhere on disk, albeit temporarily, but scrubbing programs don't necessarily know how to 
find those bits. They certainly don't seek them out proactively. So though you might pay for software, that like a uh, window washer, I think, is a very popular one. Evidence eliminator is another popular one. Um, those programs almost always have faults in them. And one of the article, the article we passed around last week by Simpson Garfinkel and another fellow at MIT, if you haven't yet had a chance to read that article, do. Because one of the things it alludes to is the fact that even people who have sold stuff on eBay or returned it to Best Buy and have proactively scrubbed their data, the programs that you have paid $50 for, $99 for to sanitize your computer, almost every commercial product has bugs in it. And a very scary paper was written a few months ago uh, by a fellow at Carnegie Mellon, I believe. And this paper essentially analyzed a whole bunch of these popular products, maybe eight or 10 of them, Evidence Eliminator, Window Washer, and a whole bunch of other ones. And every one of these programs failed to do what it just advertised on its shrink wrap box which is to say even people who put their trust in products you bought with the intention of doing something securely, you still have to trust the humans who are behind that software. So what can you, the user, do if you do want to sell your computer on eBay or just generally you're uncomfortable with giving your computer to someone else or just junking it? Well, you can scrub or wipe your computer, but you can wipe the entire thing. What all of those commercial products purport to do is erase just the sensitive parts of your computer, your internet cache, your recycle bin, your temporary folders. And it's much harder to get that right because Windows is so complicated. Mac OS is so complicated, it's hard to get every piece of evidence that might be on your computer. And by evidence, I just mean sensitive data that you might have, certainly. So what you can do is wipe or scrub your whole hard drive. And the one program that we recommend for this, based on its history and based on its being free, is actually linked on the course's website. It is pretty easy to use in that it doesn't have many options, but it doesn't have a nice, pretty interface. Rather, you have to follow a fairly arcane, old school interface. But if you go to the security section of the website, you'll see that the three programs we mentioned last week are there, AVG, Hijack This, and SpyBot. And the fourth security program that I would say that I personally recommend is called Derek's Boot and Nuke. You can download either a floppy disk image or a CD. And again, it's not the easiest thing to do, but you can install this onto a CD or floppy, boot up your PC or even Macintosh these days or Linux computer, and wipe the whole hard drive. And by that, I mean you can change all of the zeros and ones to say all zeros or to random zeros and ones. And even with these programs, you'll get different layers of security. You'll get options like, do you want one pass of zeros and ones? Do you want seven passes, like the Department of Defense officially recommends? Do you want something even more secure than that? Well, to this day, there has been no published research saying that doing more than just one pass of zeros and ones is any more effective than doing one pass of zeros and ones. But there's a lot of... Uh, a uh, myth out there or stories, lore, that folks like the NSA can you recover your data even if you've scrubbed it seven times over. Uh, this has yet to be demonstrated publicly, empirically. So most any software that scrubs the data at least once, certainly seven times, is probably sufficient protection against even someone with an electron microscope or other such expensive tools. Yeah? What about what we were discussing earlier, system recovery? System recovery? What about? Good question. So if you backed up all your important data, your documents, Excel spreadsheets, and so forth, then ran your system restore CDs or the special partition you might have, does that overwrite all of the data? Odds are no, because the bytes used by the bits used by your hard drive are partly a function of the operating system, partly a function of the hard drive itself, and it's not guaranteed that the software is going to overwrite those same zeros and ones. Moreover, when you restore your computer to its original state, you have less information there than you probably did just before you restored it, which is to say that if the operating system only needs these bits, you probably had a lot of data that was here, here, and here, and Windows and these other programs don't go on your whole hard drive and erase everything. They only use what space they want. In fact, one of the slowest parts of installing a new operating system is the formatting step. And you'll see a progress bar that maybe takes 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour to quote unquote format your hard drive. And if you format your hard drive, you'll often receive a message saying, warning, this will erase all of your data. 
It is a lie. It will not erase all of your data. It will not erase most of your data, which is to say what that process formatting is usually doing if it's slow is checking the integrity of all of the bits or locate the sectors on your hard drive, just making sure that they're still working. Because what a computer can do is if part of your hard drive is starting to fail, it can map around it so that you can use the rest of the hard drive. And that's what's slow. It is an uh, age-old lie that when you are informed by uh, Windows, this will erase information on your disk. That is not true. It will simply make it slightly harder to get it back. Other questions? I'm sorry? When you format your hard drive, all the computer is doing is setting up partition tables usually, though that's technically a different process. The computer will typically partition it, which essentially means to set up the patterns of zeros and ones that make it look like a C drive or a D drive to an operating system. And two, it often checks the integrity of all of the locations on the disk, and it tries to fix or write around any that are broken. But formatting does not officially erase data. It just happens to overwrite during that process some of the data. To actually wipe data, you need something, something free, for instance, like this Derek's boot and nuke. Other questions? Yeah. Yes, so how are CD keys and serial numbers and so forth generated? Usually it's some kind of algorithm, very similar in spirit to the cryptography stuff we briefly discussed. Um, with that said, you can often, part of the world of piracy is the world of wares. And here too is sort of elite speak type stuff where you might see it written as wares with weird capitalization. Wares just means legally distributed software. So there's plenty of wares floating around. You can download things not only like EXEs these days, but if you've ever seen them, ISOs. And ISO is just a file format for CDs, which is to say you can download entire images of CDs or DVDs and with them movies these days. And this is what a lot of the traffic being used by programs like BitTorrent, if you've heard the name, is are, are downloading. It's things like ISOs, MP3s, movie files, and so forth. And you can read crazy statistics these days that like a huge percent of internet traffic these days is the result of people using things like file sharing programs and downloading again and again lots of huge content. How are the registration and CD keys generated? Usually just by some eh, fairly complicated mathematical algorithm, but usually not so complicated that someone with enough free time can't figure out what it is. So also in this world of wares are CD cracks and pr uh, program cracks which either are little pieces of the software that analyze your .exe and change the one line of code, programming code, in the exe that says prompt for CD key. And they you know, figuratively change it to don't prompt for CD key, and that has effectively cracked the software. Alternatively, some of these programs will figure out what the algorithms are for generating the keys, and rather than ch touching your program, it will just generate a CD key for you. Yes, there is a percentage of people who will certainly figure out how to circumvent these restrictions so that they can make their own legal copies of CDs. There is also a bigger percentage of people, I would say, that say they are hacking or cracking into software so that they can make legal copies of their disks. That is the sort of goody two-shoes argument that's often put forth, to be honest, against industry when they say, this is appropriate because you always have folks saying, this is my legal right to copy data that I have already paid for and make legitimate backups of. It's, it holds some water, but uh, that's perhaps the only, it's, it's not strong ground to stand on when it comes to this stuff. Other questions, concerns? Yes, Dan has a concern. You want to come on up? Oh, is this working? Yep. Really? So much. Well, just use that record. Just use this record. Yeah. Um, okay. I will demonstrate this. And if you want to stand near me while I plug this in, Dan has an announcement to make. So, so of course, we have our usual sections and workshops. A uh, section this week is for, uh, what was it? Oh, how did this affect your PC? <laughs> Cut. <laughs> okay. See, I, I stumble because I'm, I, you know I'm going to come to class and flash the macro and say, this is how you do it. And then, no, I'm kidding. Now really, we'll go over a number of topics such as antivirus software, 
uh, safe mode, uh, how to rid your PC of uh, various malicious, malicious software and uh, the like. It's very good, especially if you've ever been infected with uh, virus or worm. Then this on workshop this Saturday, uh, last year we started the digital photography workshop and it was by far the most popular workshop. Uh, much to David's dismay, it was on the podcast, it was more popular than most of his uh, lectures even. And uh, so... I'm going to edit all of that. this out later, it's okay. Yeah, it's, yeah we'll see about be that. Ray standing here in the real video. Yeah, well, you won't be racing on Saturday, so... I'll be um, certainly uh, come by and uh, we'll talk about digital cameras, uh, talk a little bit about how they work. Uh, we'll get into some of the real nitty-gritty, and uh, we're going to pack a lot into two hours. So hopefully come and uh, bring your questions, and uh, we bring will have a great time. Yeah, bring your cameras if you want. We'll have a camera party. So, so Dan is right, truth be told, that over 8,000 people downloaded his uh, uh, podcasted digital audio workshop last year. So if that isn't endorsement enough, you you got to be there, I'm sure, this weekend. He's our resident photog. So. Um, in conclusion, what Dan has also set up for us as we spoke was this screen. I was asked last week if we could give you a sense of what a packet sniffer looks like. Here's what a packet sniffer looks like. This is Ethereal, which is a very common program. Its name has recently been changed to Wireshark. It's freely available with a program like this. If you're connected to a hub, can you sniff all of the traffic going through that hub? If you're on a wireless network that doesn't use any kind of encryption like WEP or WPA, similarly, I see a lot of notes being taken. Similarly, can you sniff all of that wireless traffic. What Dan did while we were talking earlier was sniff some of the wireless traffic that's not been going on through all the instant messages and emails some of you guys have been sending tonight. But just to protect your own privacy, we only, he only sniffed my traffic and whoever else might have been connected to Belkin 54G. So if you connected to Belkin 54G, shouldn't have done that since we have all of your traffic here right now. The takeaway for tonight, though, will be, though, as arcane as all of this looks, you should see things that look familiar in structure. On the left couple of columns, what do you clearly see? Uh, columns two and three. Source and destination, IP addresses, laid out as source and destination, which is to say Dan's program sniffed every packet that left my computer and went to some other server, and I think Chris was connected to this server, as, uh, to this router as well, so all of her traffic was similarly sniffed. Um, in the protocol column, what protocols do you recognize? DNS, HTTP, HTTP being uh, internet traffic, or HTTP being web traffic. If, for instance, I right click on this one and I say follow TCP stream, what you'll see is that one of these guys, be it Chris or Dan or someone else, uh, requested a web page of Google. So notice this is essentially the contents of the request they sent to Google. What page did they request? Well, it looks like here they requested the home page. Look at the very top line where it says get forward slash. Well, forward slash obviously refers to just the root, the home page of the site. So one of these guys visited Google. If we look one at one other line, we will see, for instance, here. Let's follow this one. Oh, that's the same one. Let me go back real quick. Clear the filter. If we scroll down instead to say, let's go slightly down to here, continuation of non-HTTP traffic, follow TCP stream. Here we'll get another page, and it looks like someone in the room not only visited Google, but they happened while we were talking to search for computer science E1. And this just gives you a taste of the kind of information that even now as those little green lights flicker on the access point is flowing back and forth in this room. And had we wanted to, for the couple of you who have been using your laptops tonight, it would have been trivial for us, ethically or not unethically, to copy every piece of data that was going from your computer to that access point. The only real protection you might have had is if you were using HTTPS or you were using a VPN server or some kind of proxy server, and I would wager that most of you probably were not doing such, in which case one sitting in this room, maybe one of you, could have been sitting here all this time watching every instant message, every web page, and every email going across the wireless network. So with that said, good night.